St Lawrence says dental care is out of reach for many Australians. Meanwhile, a report by the National Advisory Council is understood to support a call for a universal dental health care scheme. Now, the government is yet to release that report, but the Greens, who are originally were in charge of, or at least arguing in support of, putting together such a, an analysis of the state of dental care in Australia, have been given a copy of this report. So joining us now is Green Senator Richard Di Natale. Richard Di Natale, good morning. Good morning. morning. So the status of this report is? It's an interim report. So advice has been provided by the Councillor to Government and the Greens. And it's been, not been released. Why? Well, the Government's view is that uh, it should inform their thinking for next year's budget. The final report will be due in uh, January next, uh, of next year. But you can talk in general terms about it? Yes, I can. What does it recommend? Look, it's a really bold and ambitious plan. The Greens are really pleased. It recommends a significant investment in dental health in next year's budget. Uh, it suggests that we should focus on low-income earners and young kids, and we agree with that focus. It also says that the aim should be a universal scheme, a scheme like Medicare, so that essentially the mouth is treated like the rest of the body, no good reason to separate the two, and to ensure that cost, which is a major barrier to access, is no longer a factor, so that we have a universal scheme, Medicare-funded dentistry, and uh, that should be the long-term aim of government. Do you believe Australians would be happy to wear the cost of an extra levy to fund dental care? It's a very popular reform. In fact, a uh, news poll commissioned uh, just that question, and 75% of the Australian community have said they would support uh, an additional uh, Medicare levy to fund dental care. Uh, it's a huge issue, huge uh, demand in the community, particularly if you're a low-income earner and young kids uh, who aren't getting treatment at the moment simply because of the cost of dental care. All health care is expensive and getting more expensive, it seems. It's the greatest impact on past on state and also federal governments. Any government that signs on to a universal dental scheme like this is signing on for th investing huge amounts of money in perpetuity on their, their annual budget. There's no way of getting away from that, is there? Look, there are a few things. The first thing is there's a significant saving to be made. There's a huge cost on the health system generally because of untreated dental uh, disease. We were talking so, about that earlier with um, Jeff Richardson from the Centre for Health Economics. So That's right. Same thing. So when I was in general practice, you know, you'd see a lot of people coming in with untreated dental disease, one in ten visits uh, because of that. What sort of disease um, are we talking about? So we're talking about infections, abscesses, uh, we're talking about chronic pain, we're talking about people who've got poor nutrition, we've got talking about uh, diseases that impact on their other illnesses like diabetes and heart disease. So significant burden of disease. There's a huge impost on the, on the hospital system as well. So. Uh, a, a significant number of presentations to emergency departments are because people haven't had their teeth treated. There's also the uh, costs associated with lost productivity. So costs are estimated anywhere up to $2 billion in terms of the direct and indirect cost because of, with, of this un, untreated uh, dental disease. Uh, so there's a big saving to be made in that area. And the other thing to say is whether the government pays for it through a public insurance scheme like Medicare or whether the individual pays for it through fee-for-service, there's always a cost. The question is what's the most efficient and equitable way of funding it and we believe, as does uh, uh, um, the Advisory Council, that a universal scheme achieves um, both efficiency and equity. So low income earners, rural and regional Australians, those groups who at the moment aren't getting treatment. The big deterrent of course to many people is the cost of going to a dentist. We had the head of the Dental Association on the program a little earlier saying that the costs were large because essentially dental surgeries are all mini hospitals, equipment, staffing costs and the like. Does he have a point there? Oh, look, there's a significant cost. No one's arguing that there aren't costs is it, is associated it with it. Is excessive? Uh, look, uh, I don't think that Australia's costs are exorbitant, but what I do think is that for the cost to low-income earners, they're significant and they're a significant barrier to access. Um, we know that the cost of a scheme like this would be 5 to $6 billion. We know that could be funded. Our proposal would be to do it through the original mining tax. We think that was a good way to fund this sort of reform. And it's a sort of reform that... I think is one of the great challenges facing us this decade. It's right up there with Medicare, mm. uh, with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And I just think for a government, a particular Labor government, this is the sort of reform they should be taking on. They're not, so we're going to do it. Now, of course, uh, some patients can get access to, I think it's up to $4,000 under Medicare at the moment, if they have chronic illnesses resulting from their dental problems. The government is very keen to wind that scheme down. In fact, it's accusing dentists of rorting that scheme. D does the, is there any grounding for that argument? No, there's not. In fact, uh, dentists are being unfairly targeted by Medicare for making simple administrative errors through that scheme. The government's never liked it. It was a Howard government proposal and in politics, you know, ownership is everything. The government's been intent uh, to wind that scheme back 
uh, and they've targeted dentists, in my view, very, very unfairly. Uh, and uh, the dentists we've spoken to, in fact, through all the audits that have been done, no evidence of rorting, simple administrative errors, like, for example, not providing the written treatment plan back to the GP. Now, often they will have done that, but done that slightly late, uh, and they're being pinged for the full cost of providing treatment. And under that scheme, 80% of people are healthcare card holders, so a lot of people are getting treatment to uh, really urgent uh, dental care that they wouldn't otherwise have got. Can I just talk about the figures for a little more before we let you go? Jeff Richardson, who we were speaking about earlier from the Centre for Health Economics, who, uh, which of course did that Brotherhood of St Lawrence report on their behalf, said he thought the cost of a universal scheme could be around about 2 to $3 billion. Yes. Uh, and that over time, actually, it would sort of pay for itself once you got out of the healthcare system all the associated costs of the untreated medical conditions that you spoke about earlier. Is he pitching the figure too low? No, no, I think he's right. And I think it depends on a few things. There's some assumptions built into this. One is what is the scope of service you're going to provide. Yep. So you need to determine what sort of services you will provide under this scheme. Because the most expensive and elaborate dental treatments can't necessarily be provided free. That, that's right. And in some cases there will be an argument for expensive dental treatment, but there has to be a process through which an application is made to ensure that it's not just a cosmetic yep. treatment, but it's, it's necessary for that person's nutrition and, and overall health. Uh, so he's right, once those savings in terms of lost productivity and once all that unmet demand starts to be met over time, we'll find the costs come down. Look, while we have you here, Richard Zinatali, I did want to ask you about one thing that uh, I guess a, a question mark that hangs over the head of the Greens and their decision making as we end the parliamentary year. And that's in relation to the, the mining tax. And it's the fact that the Greens supported the tax as it was in the lower house, but has now reserved its right to make changes to it in the upper house. And that has drawn the ire of, I've got to say, many of our viewers and many commentators, of course, uh, as well. Why are you doing that? And if you truly support this tax, why do you want to have it both ways and be able to amend it later on at your leisure? Because what we've got is we've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to ensure that the resource boom is shared by all Australians. And at the moment, that's not happening. The tax has been watered down and watered down, and then as a result of the deal with Andrew Wilkie, watered down again. So why do you support it in the lower house if it's not what it should be? Because our view is that the Senate provides us an opportunity to provide greater scrutiny of the, of the tax. The government was very keen to get that tax through the lower house, wanted to get it done by Christmas. We said, OK, but we reserve the right to provide more scrutiny on the, on the tax and to make sure that we get as much value as we can for the Australian taxpayer, because that's what this is about. This is about providing a scheme like Denti Care through that revenue. And you have no embarrassment about doing that? Not at all. No, no, I've got no embarrassment about achieving uh, the best outcome we can in terms of sharing these, these resources. But about your word not being your bond? You know, I, I support this, but you know what, later on I might not? Well, I think we made that very clear. I mean, we said our word was we'll pass this in the lower house and we will hope to improve it through the Senate. That's the way the Senate works. It's a house of review. Our role is to make sure we get the best outcome for Australians, and we think we're going to do that through the Senate. Well, we'll see what happens in the new year. Richard Zinatale, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Thanks so much. Now, the Defence Minister, Stephen Smith, has assured India that it won't be selling